All right, what's up, guys? This is uh, this is Corey here with the Long Island Lacrosse Journal. I got Alice Lee, who's the head coach over at Williams uh, with the women's lacrosse team there. Alice, how are you guys uh, holding up right now during these times? Hi, Corey. Um, doing all right. Doing all right. Just getting through it day by day. Um, just really thankful that family and friends are safe and healthy. So um, just getting through it, finding the new normal, finding the new routine. So yeah, no, what uh, you mentioned the new normal, it's, uh, that's an interesting point for you. Um, how have you been able to adjust professionally? And did you kind of have to like, recreate like your daily routine just based on the fact that you were like in the middle you know or I guess in the early stages of your season and then that got cut short yeah um so I'll say as soon as we found out that we lost our season my first thought was we're going virtual right so like what can we do all right let's do film breakdown let's do playbook stuff let's do whatever we can um to keep going and then after like a couple of days settled in and the dust settled a little bit I realized all right, what does my team actually need right now, right? So like knowing that we're going through a global pandemic, things are a little uncertain. Um, we really reined it back in and took the focus away from lacrosse, 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 but like tailored it so that it was more about the person and human and care, um, which is one of our core values as a team. So now we're still doing lacrosse related stuff, but I went from like turbo drive to, <laughs> hey, let's do like a fun stick work challenge, something that they can like mentally and emotionally digest right now. Cause there's, you know, there's a lot going on, right? So as we settle into things and um, after talking to the different classes and players and how they're doing, what they're needing right now, we've realized like, okay, let's start out small and then ramp it up as we go and get closer to even the, the next school year in terms of preparation. So we're starting out small with little fitness challenges, fun stick work challenges. And then later as you know, our seniors even graduate and we start focusing on the uh, next year's team, then we're gonna ramp it up with the virtual stuff that I talked about, the playbook and video breakdown. Have, have colleges and universities started to talk about how they're dealing with like a virtual graduation? Is there any, is there any talks about that just yet? So there are, at, a lot of different schools and institutions. Um, for us, I think we're still trying to hold out a little bit and hold on to hope. So um, our school just announced that graduation will not be held in June. So we don't know what that looks like, if it's virtual, if it's they're gonna push the date back or whatever it is. So, um, you know, I do think our school's doing a good job of kind of like assessing the situation and not making decisions too, too early. Um, but we'll probably know in the next month or so what that could look like. Gotcha. Now, um, you talked about going virtual um, and staying connected with your team. Is there, is there a tradition that uh, you've adopted with your group where maybe each week you do something together to make sure that there's that consistency like you had before everything happened? Yeah, totally. Um, I think consistency and structure is really important. So when I first started Zooming with my freshmen, they're like, yeah, we're waking up at 12 p.m. some days and I'm like all right guys we've got to figure this out right let's get back to the schedule so um every week weekly Wednesday team zoom from seven to eight o'clock so that's in their lacrosse google calendars and they know that it's an opt-in opt-out um whether or not they can make it right so now with online classes starting up and you know things that they have to do at home um we're keeping it totally optional but I will say we get like more than 90% of our team zooming in during those times. So um, what we've done already has been like team yoga. Um, we're gonna do teammate trivia and just keeping it different every week so that people are excited um, for that team Zoom. We also do smaller little things where um, within our group me account, we have like a Sunday selfie. So at any point on a Sunday, someone will just send a selfie of what they're doing. And it's just fun to stay connected that way and low stakes. Um, we do stuff for our social media too. So you might see on Instagram, like the no ball, no problem challenge, where each class year created a fun little video of what they're doing without a ball, um, depending on what people's situations are at home, right? Like, can they even get outside or are they just in their homes? Um, what do they have access to? So we do that. We do fun little weekly fitness challenges because our girls, they're really good about staying in shape. Yeah. Um, so we try to like mix it up and just make it competitive too. At the same time. Is it big, is a big part about the girls on your team and their discipline 
Um, you know, you just mentioned staying in shape as one example, a result of just kind of like the school that you're at, because, you know, like in your conference, it's not like, you know, you have this like structured, strict off season schedule where your coaches are like, all right, you got to be here at this time. You got to do this at that time. Um, does that kind of play into the personality and the makeup maybe of your girls and their discipline as well? Yeah, Corey, I think you're totally right about that. Um, I mean, with our conference and our school, we can't be there in the off season to make sure that they're getting their workouts in, they're getting their runs in. So they have to be intrinsically motivated. And a school like Williams just attracts people who are, um, you know, like the really motivated type who want to challenge themselves on the field, in the classroom. So I think you're absolutely right about that. Like that's, it's just the makeup of our girls and you kind of have to be because if you're not someone who can get up every morning at 6 a.m. and push yourself to go out on a run, you're going to fall behind the pack. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I will say that's why I really love coaching our girls because I know they'll, they'll do the work. Whatever I send them, they're like, yep, got it. It's all about, mm -hmm. I think, for them, like, reining it back in. Like, hey, you're doing too much. You're going to push yourself to injury right now. So we right. kind of have that opposite problem. Yeah, absolutely. And from I've never been to campus. I would love to get up there maybe on our next college road tour. But yeah. I hear just stepping onto campus at Williams, it's a, it's kind of a special place. Um, from your experience um, now, is this your third season? Is that right? Yep, third season. Third, Still feels quick. like I've only had two, though. <laughs> <laughs> so two, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, like for you, like what what kind of uh, drew you to, to Williams and what kind of makes it that special place, as people mentioned, who maybe have gone there or visited, et cetera? Yeah, totally. Um, so I've been coaching in the NESCAC for six years before I got to Williams. So I was familiar with the school, familiar with the program, because whenever we played them, you like held your breath during the game because you're like, don't know what's going to happen. Or we're going to come out on top. Who knows? Um, so when the position opened after the longtime head coach, she'd been here for 37 years. So wow. yeah. And she did an awesome job with the program. When she retired, I knew that was a position I wanted to go for. Um, Cause I knew that you can win championships at Williams college and lots of teams do. And it's a place that people want to go to. Um, like you said, it's special. Once you set foot on campus, you're like, all right, I get it. I get it because, mm -hmm. I mean, the mountains, it doesn't compare to anywhere else. And um, every year when the alums come back and I'll say, like, we get little note cards in our mailbox, like, from the alumni office, we're like, okay, just a fair warning. It's alumni weekend. So, you know, if things get too much, just let us know. And that's because thousands of people come back for alumni weekend every year because many of our kids when they graduate they work in cities they have these big time jobs but they'll never have another experience like Williams so year right. after year they come back um but yeah I would say that's what drew me just you know all things Williams where you can win you can be successful and people here are just a tight-knit committed community so wow well, that was a mouthful but <laughs> <laughs> it's no it's true I know there's uh there's some families in our program um, you know, we, we have we have a young man who's playing on the men's team there. Um, we also have some parents who have went there and they just the way they speak of it and their eyes light up, you know, and they talk about the school, which um, which is understandable. Um, I'm, I'm also curious, just as you kind of, uh, you know, went through your coaching journey that led you to Williams. You know, I know you had stops at at Amherst and Middlebury specifically in the conference. Also, I believe you're at Buffalo State right before yes. that. Now, big difference, right? So you're recruiting to a state school and then you come into like the NESCAC conference. How was that kind of like shift for you in terms of like a re just recruiting process in general? I'm sure there's a lot of other differences, but. Yeah, Corey, that was a big change. <laughs> like that just blew my mind, recruiting for a SUNY school and recruiting for NESCAC. So um, I think about just like the number of kids who reach out um, so a couple of differences. When I was recruiting for Buff State, we were primarily looking at New Yorkers, um, people who wanted to stay in the state, who wanted um, a different type of just um, experience where for SUNY schools, you can play year round fall ball um, and, you know, when you're in season. And then going over to the NESCAC, I think it the same is true for Amherst, Mid, and Williams. We just get a different level of just communication where I had maybe like 30 kids reaching out to me 
across the entire year for SUNY versus now hundreds of kids reaching out because they want um, to come play, right? Sure. So I think like even going to tournaments, the ex my first experience for a SUNY school was, okay, let's, let's try to just watch a field and see who we like and then and reach out to them and see if they're interested. Now in coaching here at Williams, we have a list of hundreds of kids who have already reached out and said they're interested. So now it's kind of a process of elimination and figuring out who's a good fit athletically. And then that second piece, who's a good fit academically, right? So yeah, um, yeah so it was really different. And geographically, our players come from everywhere. Um, mm -hmm. Just because of the school itself, it draws people from all over. Um, and then there's that academic piece that's really different where for each school, we have to meet a certain marker, right? So it can't just be, can you play? Can you write? Now it's like, all right, what are your SAT scores? What are yeah. your transcripts? So. Um, so coaching for two great programs. So it's not just like you were working at Amherst and Middlebury who are kind of bottom of the pack teams. They were, you know, super competitive, winning national championships at Middlebury and you're knocking on the door at Amherst who had experience, you know, national championship experience. I'm just kind of curious, what did you take from those coaching uh, opportunities and that, and those jobs that you kind of brought to this program and maybe put your own stamp on that has allowed you to, you know, continue to grow the program in the direction you want it to go? Yeah, great question. I had two incredible mentors um, from those programs. So Kate Livesay from Middlebury and Chris Paradis from Amherst, both of whom are incredible coaches and people who I still stay in touch with. We talk um, often about lacrosse, about life. And so I've taken so much from them, Corey, and from everyone who I've encountered as coaches. I think the common thread between the two of them and I think between just all the coaches in the NESCAC is the focus on the player as a whole, as a person, where, um, yes, are we all super competitive? Are those two super competitive? Absolutely. But at the end of the day, like, we know what's most important, that big picture. And I think if you can focus on building up that person first, then you're, you're going to see so much potential and so much upside in them as a player. Um, so that was a big takeaway that – just like overall philosophy takeaway that I got from them. And again, it's just like how you do it personally, right? The day-to-day -day stuff. So um, yeah, and I think mm. I'm just amazed at how even Chris from Amherst, and I hope she sees this because I'm so impressed with her still year after year, and she's been doing this for 30 years. 30 plus, she just gets better every year. And she mm -hmm. still thinks about like, all right, how do we be different? How do we get better? And yeah. that's a huge takeaway. Like she's a legendary coach and she's still like, I want to learn more. Yeah. Right. So that's we, something I still take with me. Yeah. I got the pleasure to meet her uh, this past February as we visited Amherst and just kind of, you know, learn about her program and, you know, just, just her philosophies. And I was so impressed by just how adjusted she is to everything, you know, whether it be like the online recruiting platforms to how she's maybe building a more diverse team, um, how she's adjusting to, you know, what, what her school and just what the area has to offer for her potential students, which, you know, it just seems like such a comprehensive experience, which is, which is so cool. I noticed too, when you were there, you were involved in the diversity and inclusion committee. What, what is that exactly? And talk about why that was maybe um, important part of like your role uh, when you were a coach there. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's something that I'm still interested in now um, and something that we're still working on now here at Williams. But at Amherst, when I was a part of that committee, it was essentially assessing the athletics department and the culture and thinking about ways in which we can be inclusive. So um, not only were at the time when I was at Amherst where we focused on recruiting diversity, but also like, okay, once we're there, once the students are there, coaches are there, um, how do we make it an inclusive spot? So um, it was really at the time when it started up, it was in like the brainstorming phase. And I'll say Amherst has done a great job as a whole, as a school with diversifying um, their population. And so um, I'm curious to see what that committee is up to now but at the time we were in like the baby stages right and just sure. like um figuring that out what it looks like and assessing the department 
Yeah, no, that's great. Uh, just it kind of it's in line with like the bigger picture perspective as you're talking about with within the conference. I'm curious too, now that um, everything is more kind of virtual, have there been any interactions between teams within the conference since everything ended or is the focus still a little bit more on like, hey, we're just helping our, our girls and our programs through this time? Yeah, um, I think it's starting to shift and something that we've talked about as NESCAC coaches. So we've been Zooming at least twice now weekly just as a conference just to brainstorm share ideas and talk about like what we want to do so um you might see sooner than later in all of our social media accounts some sort of like internet cat challenge um mm -hmm. so definitely something that we've been talking about and for our girls like to help them and to take care of them at as people like they want the challenge so mm -hmm. um that's what we're recognizing too it's not like like they actually want something like when we talk to them they're like i'm so bored alex like 12 <laughs> hours in my day <laughs> right like they have online classes but it's not the same so they definitely have more time on their hands and they they want stuff to do. yeah and especially you know when you know you're you're maybe not competing as much in the summer and you don't have ball ball and like this is your time to compete and unless you're playing two sports like you know they they crave that so to give that is is important and totally understandable um all right great well we have um just a couple minutes i always like to leave um the conversation kind of just maybe just get shedding some light and giving some advice to maybe maybe a, a, a girls lacrosse recruit who might be kind of going through you know the process right now and it's kind of uncertain times and it's a little questionable about where things are but either way what's maybe one piece of advice you you generally give to just recruits if you're maybe speaking at a showcase or um, maybe talking to someone face to face in your, in your office yeah totally um i think a piece of advice that I typically always give recruits is it's a two-way process. Um, I think sometimes recruits lose sight of that because they're like, okay, I want to make sure that, you know, this program, this coach really wants me and likes me and this is where I want to go. I think it's important for them to remember to also try and find the right fit for them, right? So sometimes um, I think students lose sight of that and they're like, oh, I want, I, I want this because on paper, this is where I'm supposed to go. This is what mm -hmm. it's supposed to be, but really get to know the coach, get to know the program, get to know the players. If you haven't talked to a player on their team yet, that's, you know, that's something that you should probably do, right? See if the culture is what you want to be a part of, see if, you know, the school is what you want to be a part of. So just remembering that it's, finding a fit for them as well will be important. And now they have time. Um, I think, you know, the whole world is kind of at a standstill right now and seasons mm -hmm. are canceled. Who knows what's going to happen with recruiting events. So this is the time to, okay, let's take a pause, take a breath and figure out what's an actual good fit for me, right? Across yeah. the board. So, um, so hopefully they can use this opportunity to do that. Great. That's great advice, Alice. I really appreciate your time and, yeah, we wish you guys nothing but luck as you kind of keep the program moving in a positive direction. Great. Thanks, Corey. And congrats to you and your wife. Though. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs>